All right. A very good morning to everyone on the West Coast. Good afternoon, everyone else. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, I'm Rahul Bintlish. I'm Vice President of Sales for Grid Dynamics. We are a technology services company focused on digital transformation of enterprises in the US. We're headquartered in uh, the Bay Area in California. Uh, we have a very eminent uh, set of panelists today for today's webinar. We do these webinars you know, throughout the year. Actually, we're doing two every month. Uh, today's is part of a series that we do on the financial services uh, that includes really banking, financial services, and insurance companies for us. Uh, let's go through a quick introduction of our panelists, uh, starting with Jimmy. Um, yes, it is a pleasure for me to be here, and uh, hopefully I will be able to answer most of all the questions, and the, the topic is uh, very it's a topic of passion of mine. And I just want to let the audience know that uh, just a quick disclaimer, I am a practitioner and I'm a researcher on the topic of uh, fun, uh, digital banking and the views and opinions I will be expressing today in our discussion come from my research and from my years of practice uh, and, and belong solely to me and does not represent the views of my employers in any organization that I will be. Uh, that I will be sharing, that I will be taking as example. But it is a pleasure to uh, to be here, I hold, and looking forward to uh, to the panel discussion. Thank you, Jimmy. Jimmy, welcome aboard, uh, Sudhakar. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sudhakar. I work with uh, Truist. Uh, my employer is in a very unique situation. Um, you would have uh, probably heard SunTrust Bank and BBNT merge together to form Truist. So we are right in the middle of a merger. As part of my organization, uh, all authenticated public facing websites are uh, under me. So uh, again, I'm going to borrow what Jimmy said. Uh, my opinions are uh, pretty much coming from my experience and uh, what uh, we're trying to do and not uh, a view from the uh, company. Thank you, Sudhakar. Kiran? Hello, everyone. Kiran Nadgir. I head the API and UX platforms at Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, we're headquartered in Santa Clara with offices all over the world. And I uh, manage the build out of their API platform, API governance, and both for internal and external APIs and the user experience platforms as well. Glad to be here. Thanks, Thank you. Raj? Hi. I'm Raj Kumar Bundukula, and uh, I'm a data science fellow and vice president at Equifax. Um, I run a, a team of data scientists and big data engineers, and uh, we are part of uh, uh, Equifax Innovation Office. Our charter is to work on capabilities that would bring us revenue in three to five years. And uh, here, like Jimmy and other people, most of uh, the opinions expressed in in this talk are my opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Equifax. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Raj. So we'll get into a discussion about the top te technology priorities uh, for the industry in 2021. I'll start with you, Kiran. Uh, what are the top three opportunities uh, that you are prioritizing in 2021 for, uh, for business impact and how do they compare to 2020? So I would say that uh, where 2020 uh, made a difference for us was that uh, it helped accelerate a lot of the transformation initiatives that we had planned um, in beginning in early 2019. The difference that we saw, uh, we are seeing this year is the acceleration on all of those initiatives, right? So when we look at what are the top three uh, opportunities that we see, I think it's more than just three. So I will expand that on a little bit. Uh, essentially, if I were to circle them up in three, it's essentially technology modernization as a whole. Uh, and I'll go into details of that as well. There is data and analytics and essentially globalization of our capabilities, right? And when we look at uh, globalization, it is it goes down goes back to the very first point of modernization, which is saying that what does modernization really mean uh, uh, from a technology perspective? It's uh, it goes uh, along the lines of cloud adoption, right? 
it goes uh, we we are building out our api platform we have an api strategy in place it uh, also includes devsecops uh, quality engineering and automation around all of this right and as part of our acceleration what we have done is we have set up uh, centers for enablement which is again building out those capabilities providing all of these capabilities as a service so that the teams that are building the products and services are able to do that in an automated fashion as much as an automated fashion um, including the governance automation as well right so reducing the dependency on people to do certain things by leveraging automation is key from a globalization perspective uh, taking uh, capabilities that we're building for the us for example and making it available in uk or europe or india or what have you it's leveraging the cloud and all of the automation around it is where we are going so those are the top 3 for us which is modernization uh, leveraging data and analytics to uh, help business make better decisions so we are also focused that's one of our top priorities for 21 and the global operating model thank you kiran uh, sudhakar your bank is significantly different compared to silicon valley bank you are more consumer focused uh, how do the priorities look like for you uh, thanks kiran for kind of uh, throwing light on uh, the priorities uh um, from our uh, standpoint we are uniquely positioned because of the timing right we are right in the middle of a merger uh, it's not fully completed even though we announced it uh, last february um the process is not complete so uh, we have different challenges at the same time uh, we are uniquely positioned because both the banks have uh, similar systems we were competitors to be uh, kind of in the market right very similar sized the market segments could vary but then we had uh, similar uh, applications that are there so we are uniquely positioned to kind of pick the best that is going to be there and at the same time uh, uh, you know do what uh, we thought is the right solution right no tech debt need to be carried forward and things like that so with that unique position um the top three priorities the first one is really uh, supporting what we call as client day one right the legal day one is the day we got recognized and our stock got repurposed as truest uh the client day one is really where a client walks into a branch or goes online and then he sees the truest brand today he sees a uh, bbnt brand and santos brand because that's the way it is today so our first priority is to make sure that we support our clients on the client day 1 uh, which is coming up uh, the first quarter of 22 right so we we have an entire year of work planned for that uh, while we are doing that uh, two other aspects that actually come our way is the client experience right uh, client experience uh, we could just pick anything that's out in the market and do the websites and the mobile applications that are there but today the client um, expectations are changing especially with the with the biggest uh, digital transformation agent called covid everybody is now digital right everybody's expectation is different everybody wants to bank in a certain way so uh, we're trying to marry the 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 demand that we saw coming in from last years uh pandemic plus the best practices from both the organizations so digital experience taking the bank uh, to where the client wants us to be uh, is the second priority the third one is really availability right uh, digital availability uh, and and that's probably where uh, what kiran mentioned comes into picture technology modernization leveraging cloud uh, whole bunch of uh, other things where we can make our systems completely available Uh, what's the point in having the best of breed if it is not available right so uh, not only are we dependent on a whole bunch of uh, third party partners to provide our services um, we we wanted to focus on having uh, the truest digital services available 24/7 so the top three priorities again uh, honoring our client day one making sure that the digital experience is uh, top notch and uh, digital availability thank you sudhakar uh, just a follow up to that um, 
the innovation using digital technologies has seen a huge uptick uh, post COVID. Uh, so just a follow up to the priorities, uh, how are you looking at from an innovation budgets perspective? Are you investing more in 2021 compared to, to last year? Uh, absolutely. Uh, so uh, Raul, innovation has kind of been um, ingrained in BAU, right? I kind of look at innovation as two different uh, uh, parts. One is kind of that which is ingrained in each and every uh, thing that we deliver. Um, and the second one is uh, that which breaks the uh, ground, right? For example, uh, we are talking about uh, BAU, like you know, including Alexa, making sure that the function features are available uh, with uh, our regular channels, right? And people's uh, expectations are very different, right? People want to make a payment to their bill uh, using cash. That's normal, right? Whatever money is in your bank, you use to pay. But today, the expectation is that I should be able to pay using a credit card, debit card, to the extent that if somebody had uh, miles in an airline, they would like to use that to pay uh, their credit card uh, or, or their utility bill, right? It, it's kind of innovation coming from that standpoint. Um, specifically for Truist, uh, one innovation has always been part of uh, our uh, BAU, I'll call it business as usual. But in addition to that, uh, because our headquarters is in Charlotte, uh, there is a innovation center that we are putting together more for uh, uh, folks to come together and start ideating, right? Um, now, things could be very different. You have uh, uh, regular digital where you go to online or mobile, but then there is this new uh, areas that people are used to, like the Xboxes of the world or Playstations, right? Can you bring in uh, a banking experience to those users where they are currently? So uh, th there is uh, the, the groundbreaking innovation that is also being looked at. So between the two, uh, Raul, we are looking at uh, constantly in innovating uh, our, not only our client experience, but at the same time, uh, make sure that uh, we are continuously educating ourselves, right? To, to deliver to our clients. Thank you, Sudhakar. Uh, and Raj, uh, Equifax uh, is different from uh, other companies being represented today uh, or uh, leaders from other companies that we have today in terms of it being more of like a credit bureau than a real bank. Uh, how are priorities and uh, innovation looking for you in 2021? So in Equifax, innovation is considered within the DNA of the company itself, like pretty much every business unit and COE are constantly innovating. So they are, we are constantly required to do that. In addition to uh, businesses and COEs uh, constantly innovating, we also have a specific innovation team and uh, the, which I am part of to, to go deeper. Who Our full-time job is to think about developing capabilities that will bring us revenue in three to five years. So we, our innovation happens in terms of our core is risk modeling. Like, like for example, the, the, the major use of our data is risk modeling. So we, would, we constantly are striving to innovate in terms of risk modeling and both in terms of the data that we create, the attributes that we create and uh, the modeling technologies that we create and uh, the use of uh, this data in different, different. So innovation happens in many, many aspects. Then as far as marketing, so similarly, so we do have multiple data assets uh, within within whatever uh, uh, governance rules and without with, within that con uh, uh, constraints, we are also constantly thinking about how can we use this data for uh, novel marketing applications. Mm -hmm. And finally, fraud is our third major business where we are trying to use uh, we are um, we are trying to use how can we use all of our different data assets to prevent fraud. Like like we play in the space of uh, uh, account origination fraud. So that is like when somebody walks into a truest bank or a uh, like a Silicon Valley bank, we want to make sure that the person is uh, it's actually who you say you are. And we, we specifically play in that space now with our acquisition. There's also uh, now we are also going to play in other spaces as well. So in, within this three contexts like you know, risk, marketing, and fraud, we constantly are keeping 
uh, trying to understand what is the latest and greatest in terms of machine learning. So like when we have a, our team, we already have close to 20 patents in the last five years or so. Uh, we come up with different things, we demonstrate the value of it, uh, like in terms of deep learning, in terms of graph technologies, uh, in terms of other uh, use of AI and uh, ML and NLP, in terms of how, how can we extract uh, information from our data, specifically we're also looking at unstructured data and so on. Thank you, thank you Raj. Uh, Jimmy, I will move on to you. Uh, and we are seeing a trend uh, and a lot of buzz around services platforms. Uh, in fact, uh, according to one survey, 80% of the banking executives believe that the future of finance is a services platform that consumers can access via mobile. How are you staying ahead of that trend? All right, that's a that's a that's an excellent question, and uh, I'd like to start by saying, do you remember the famous commercial with Capital One that says, "What is in your wallet"? I mean, other banks, I'm sure, were working on on the background. However, they were pretty much shouting it at the top from the mountain top, and pretty much in every single of their commercial. So banking is and will continue to trend towards digitization, just like we, I mean, the other panelists just mentioned. COVID-19 pandemic accelerated or revealed the value of financial technology solutions and enhanced user experience, seamless functionality, greater control and visibility into finances, is what many corporate and small business end users are really demanding uh, to be part of their banking experience. And I'm, I'm trying also to make the distinction between banks, where, which is the traditional brick and mortar financial institution that we go into. So you have commercial banks, retail banks, um, shadow banks, credit unions, versus banking, which is the transaction, the business activities, uh, where we conduct doing payment, deposits, lending, and so forth. So how are we staying ahead of the trend? So Bank of America is really leading the pack. American banker revealed that Bank of America has dominated digital banking by all measures and has planned to stay ahead of the game. Here are some numbers that I can share with you. Uh, and I believe those numbers may have changed since their general release. Bank of America has more than 66 million consumer customers and 10 billion times a year is the number of interactions between Bank of America and its consumer customers. And 90% of those interactions are digital. I mean, mobile, online, and also to the interactive voice response. There are about 38 million digital users, 19 million mobile banking logins a day. Um, there are about 30.4 million mobile banking users. So, and also the bank has the artificial intelligence uh, virtual assistance called Erica. If you're Bank of America, you remove the AM, you have Erica. Uh, Erica, there are about 12 million users getting help from, uh, from Erica per month. And also the bank has the Zelle application. There's about 11.7 million people use on the bank version. So how is the bank staying ahead of this trend? The answer is simple. Bank of America is a company that has for goal to bring never before possible convenience to clients. So when you bring all those technology technologies, uh, all those digital aspects, whether it's current trend and future trend, you bring in and you try to normalize it to the day-to-day clients so they don't have to worry about the technology itself, but mainly the processes by which they need to get things done. Uh, one of the recent uh, innovation or release the bank has is the new digital debit card that clients can use to perform transaction immediately without waiting for their physical permanent card. And as we as we move forward towards a cashless society, which probably will take some time, the credit card area most likely is going to be uh, the next sector that will start that will start seeing some type of fragmentization as people now. Uh, we'll start dealing with digital card instead of the physical the, the physical card itself. Great. Uh, thank you, Jimmy, for that detailed response. Uh, Sudhakar, uh, 
you have a unique challenge uh, with the merger as well. Uh, how is it uh, for you in terms of this trend? Yes, uh, so Rahul, I think, uh, you know, uh, both uh, you know, the heritage companies uh, applications have been rated pretty high by Javelin, right? So that kind of sets a stage saying that when we do the work for Truist, we kind of need to beat our own records. So uh, if you look at uh, mobile application, it becomes stable stakes, right? If you don't have a mobile application, you're not a bank at all. Uh, and if you start looking at uh, uh, the, the usage of it, uh, it comes handy uh, because of uh, the way it is put together, right? For example, if you get a check, your mobile application is the one that allows you to deposit without even getting off your house. Um, you have a problem, your alert comes to your mobile and you have actionable alerts to prevent a fraud from happening, right? Though it goes to email as well, the device that is always stuck to you is your mobile device, right? So uh, warnings, alerts, all those are coming to your mobile devices. Now, there are many applications, like if you switch your uh, consumer to, to corporate world, um, even the corporates are now starting to adapt uh, um, mobile, uh, not because of uh, the function feature richness, but uh, more from executives, right? You start having wire approvals uh, attached to your mobile device, and then anybody in your accounts receivable raise a request, your exec may still be in a board meeting, but the alert is what is going to kind of, uh, what to say, subtly inform him that there is something important waiting for him amidst another important board meeting, right? So the usage of mobile application uh, has kind of uh, come to being of its own. So you probably need to be there. Uh, so whatever Jimmy mentioned, uh, the kind of proves that uh, mobile is really where uh, the application needs to be. But come to think of it, there is another uh, set of uh, mobile application that comes to, right? So for example, Alibaba's of the world or Amazon's of the world, they have kind of come to um, a different set of consumer base that uses these applications. Now, you have many ways in which you can pay for them, right? Uh, we, as a financial organization, are looking at something called the embedded financials, right? Where uh, you could be the funding source for making a payment to something that you buy in Amazon or in Alibaba, right? So. Uh, not only are we going to have an application of our own, but we need to be able to find ways in which we can coexist in an ecosystem with the partners to be able to provide services for them. So think about uh, Amazon options coming down and saying credit card, debit card, your PayPal, and then your own bank, right? Uh, if you have an option to pay with your own bank, you would feel much safer to make that uh, transaction as opposed to uh, providing your detail to an external source, right? Given all the fraud and, and security hacks that are out there today. So uh, kind of morphing itself, uh, it's becoming uh, or, or trying to take a life of its own as we go. So uh, the, the two priorities, one kind of looking at uh, your current BAU needs uh, of what the customers want and two, trying to be in places where uh, you coexist in an ecosystem. Great, thank you, Sudhakar. Uh, quickly for the audience, I see there is one uh, question being asked in the uh, Q&A section. Uh, I will come to the Q&A uh, at the end uh, of the panel discussion, uh, which will be about 35 minutes past the hour. If others have questions, please uh, keep adding it there. Uh, and I will pick them up for our panelists at that point in time. Some of you test upon uh, customer experience, uh, and that's clearly a big competitive advantage for every financial institution, whether bank or otherwise. Uh, Kiran, how are you looking at modernizing customer experience uh, this year? Sure. So I would uh, expand on that a little bit. Um, I know customer experience is absolutely critical uh, as we are serving customers, but what also impacts customer experience is the employee experience, right? 
So we are we are looking at it from both those angles in what are the changes that we need to do to be able to do that, right? So and where uh, 2020 helped us refocus our efforts was really on the digital part, right? Uh, making sure that uh, we are a relationship driven brand, right? Uh, a lot of it was in-person meetings with clients and uh, discussions and all that, but now everything has gone virtual. So focusing on taking that experience that was a physical experience and moving into a, to a digital world, right? which means that how do we take our, for example, onboarding process, right? Which uh, involved a lot of manual work. Now do we completely digitize it both for the customers and our employees as well, all the relationship managers that we have, right? So that's an example of how we are addressing or changing that, that customer experience. So taking the, not just onboarding, but servicing and even payments, right? I think uh, Sudhakar made a point of that, of uh, embedded finance. But expanding that on a little bit, right? Uh, where we are focusing from an enhanced customer experience is that it's no longer necessary for customers to leverage your uh, a bank's online portal to conduct uh, transactions anymore, right? That's where we uh, are leveraging APIs to not only power our online banking systems, but also empowering our partner ecosystems to leverage the same, which is where you are providing a similar experience irrespective of where your customer is interacting with the bank from, right? So, and that is the key here is that irrespective of where they come in through, whether they're coming through an externally exposed API or they're using your online banking experience, that, uh, that consistent experience across different channels is the key, right? The other parts is, uh, other two things is, the, is, the, is what Sudhagar touched upon as well, is the reliability, right? It's not enough to say that you have a great mobile experience or a great online banking experience, but how reliable it is, right? When a customer submits a payment, for example, how do you guarantee that it's gonna be successful, right? Or if it's not successful, then how do you make sure that there is, there is a way for them to fix that. So making sure that the experience is not only consistent, but reliable and available 24 seven, because we, have, we are in that world now where, you know, the bank branch may close at 6 p.m. or whatever, but the transactions keep going for, for 24 seven. So we have to, uh, that, has, that has accelerated a lot, uh, especially now. And that is going to be the path forward, right? We are no longer a, a nine to seven operation, but we have to make sure the systems are available. And lastly, it is the analytics and the, the what do you call the data that is provided to the customers, right? How do we leverage the data from all the interactions and help them uh, make better decisions? And I think we are uh, being a commercial bank. We are in the space of uh, uh, of uh, startups, right? And we we help build startups. We take them uh, through their life cycle. So as the needs for these companies change, how do we build that exp life cycle experience to help them do better and do it digitally, right? So overall, those are the things we are looking at. How do we digitize the experience? How do we provide a consistent experience for uh, irrespective of the channels? And how do we make it reliable and more self-serve than before? Great, thank you, Kiran. And Sudhakar, uh, being responsible for online banking and client portals, uh, I assume uh, you live and breathe customer experience every day. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. How, how, how does it look for you this year? So that def definition has been changing constantly, Rahul. So, uh, if, if you looked at earlier, customer experience was around uh, providing a, a good uh, environment or the layout where people can interact with uh, your, your banking experience, right? That was kind of what was originally there. But now the clients are asking for something more, right? We, 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 they make transactions, we provide them the information, right? What they are now looking for is uh, insights and intelligence, right? To, to what... Uh, uh, Raj and Kiran both alluded to, right? Uh, the artificial intelligence is really where people are looking at. They're asking, okay, all the banking transactions that you do, what does it mean to me, right? Am I going to be having enough money to make my rent payment for the month? Or do I do things like, you know, 
duplicate uh, payments like like for streaming services right if i pay netflix as well as this uh, can you show me or am i paying spotify as well right so they are looking for insights uh, from uh, the banks that we are uh, that that they want their financial uh, well being to be taken care of right so we are kind of considered like the doctors um, you you can say a regular doctor or a veterinary doctor right a veterinary doctor has to figure out what's going on with the patient while a regular doctor uh, kind of can talk to you and say hey what's going on i have a fever or what not so we are now more moving towards the veterinary doctor psychology where we need to understand what the client really needs and he's not going to tell you that it's paining or it's doing this but you can be very sure that if you don't uh, do that they're going to go away to the next bank that's available right or or what what's going to be uh, delivered to them so customer experience has been more towards this insights and intelligence um, the second aspect is really on the security part of it right uh, with so many digital presence and so many transactions happening in digital world uh, the key that they are looking at is how secure is it for me to operate uh, with the bank right so not only am i going to be having a spread of buffet of services am i doing it in the right manner and am i doing it in the most secure manner that's kind of the challenge uh, that we have seen rahul um so the covid has not only just made that worse because if you go back and take the last 10 years trend it's come to a complete uh, flip flop in the last 10 months so people's expectation has not only uh, increased skyrocketed Uh, but their expectations are way different from what it is so we kind of changing the engine of a plane as it is flying in fact there are two planes flying in parallel we need to build a third jumbo jet with the good parts from each of those engines right that's where my challenge is great thank you sudhakar uh, i know we are almost at uh, 35 past the hour uh, what i'll do is uh, i will start including Uh, some of the questions uh, into my discussions with you, uh, Jimmy. We were going to talk about payments, which is uh, showing a very significant uh, innovation in the industry. Uh, whether it is payments through WhatsApp messages, uh, contactless uh, payments, and like one of someone in the audience mentions, cryptocurrencies. Uh, what what are you seeing in terms of trends and focus areas? Yes, Rahul. That's a that's a big question. <laughs> in terms of uh, when you're talking about financial solution, promise to revolutionize the way consumer pay and transfer money. And uh, first, want to make sure that uh, provide a, a quick background on when we're talking about payment. So we all pretty much custom with what I will call a semi cashless. society because we use our credit card and there are a lot of applications that are being built uh, on existing payment system so i will be talking quickly about four different kind of uh, payment system to uh, to really get into where we are now and where i see the trend going so the first one we talk about is mobile payments mobile payments can you can you can segregate that into seven categories you have uh, sms or text messages that you can use to pay for products and services you have direct mobile payments that use the two factor authentication or or a one time password uh, some of us are pretty much very used uh, pretty much very regular that we use that and we have online wallets that's paypal amazon google apple you have quick response or qr code payments you have the contactless uh, we call them the nfc communication when when you go to walmart or to any of the stores you take your credit card and you wave it into that machine you have cloud based mobile payments you even have uh, this one i don't even i don't i've seen it very in few places it's the audio signal mobile payments it's what we call the near sound data transfer pretty much uh, what it is you know, it produces audio signatures that the microphone over the cell phone can pick up to enable electronic transactions not only so those are the category for mobile payments that many of us have pretty much have used at least one of those categories we have streamlined payments have to do with location based payments or geotagging some of the companies that 
pretty much re- prevalent in that in that field is Magic Band, BPay, uh, Ship Wallet. You have integrated billing, uh, Uber, other ahead organization that in, deals a lot with mel- mobile ordering or payment access apps. And last is the next generation security, which is where most of the trend is really gearing towards uh, biometrics, location-based identification, tokenization standards, and Visa, MasterCard, they're very involved in some of those. Uh, now, we cannot leave behind uh, AI and machine learning and cryptocurrency also part of those that you will, but I like to put that in different category by itself. As we enter 2021, um, what I have seen, not necessarily some of those technologies because they will just pop up. They don't really tell you when they're popping up. But what I'm seeing happening is the trends towards the cashless, uh, more cashless and invisible uh, methods that will enable data-driven engagement platforms for customers. Uh, the world will not be cashless in the next 11 months. Let's be, let's be clear, because there are some challenges. You have merchant adoption. Not all mom and pop shops accept credit cards or mobile payments. Uh, cash is convenient when you go to the farmer's market or when my kids want to go to the neighborhood store, they will still use cash. But there will be also a segment of the population that is without primary bank accounts or they are developing countries in the world uh, that are, do not have the infrastructure uh, for that. Nonetheless, you do have the trend that is going towards cryptographic protocols, peer-to-peer uh, transfers, and mobile money which is different from mobile payments. One of the challenges that those, those uh, trains will face, it, it's the fraud uh, that is still relevant in trying to find what type of regulations to put around those um, that currently banks, uh, banks have the trust of consumers when you make your deposit in the bank, the regulation pretty much provide that safeguard that your money is safe. But when you go outside of deposits, you get into payments, lending, it's a whole, it's a whole different world. In summary, what I'm, what I'm uh, seeing more is areas of the payment market where there will be a consolidation of all the payment methods that I just mentioned. And banks will have a harder time to evaluate credit worthiness for, cons- for customers because you, you're looking at the fragmentation of the market. It's going to be hard to really evaluate payments because I can make all my payments to PayPal or so on and so forth that the bank may not have access to. So the role of traditional financial institution will change. And, and I believe it's going toward that trajectory. It will change due to the evolution of decentralized or non-traditional payment options or schemes that consumers will have available. I see this to be more of an imminent uh, change in the way we do business when it comes to bank and banking. Thank you, Jimmy. And uh, to your point of the roles being changing, uh, Equifax probably has to deal with uh, their role in this new world, uh, especially when the payments uh, are becoming so diverse. Uh, how does the role of the agency change, Raj? And how are you leveraging modern technologies to deal with things like fraud? Yeah, so like as, as, as you all know, recently we just announced acquisition of cloud. So uh, we both have homegrown or organic technologies that we developed and we have been developing, constantly developing behind the scenes. And on top of it, we have been, uh, we have been acquiring companies that can help us in this area. So like one is like when one is obviously acquisition of data and also um, both acquisition of both acquisition and developing new technologies that will help us to take advantage of the data that we just acquired. Great. So uh, I know we may have uh, time for a couple more questions here. Uh, and I see a question coming around APIs uh, around cloud. Uh, So Jimmy, what's your opinion about uh, open API architectures? 
uh, you know, in Europe, at least there is a banking regulation about open banking that is driving those kind of architectures, but we don't have such a regulation in the US. Do you see the US banking industry going in that direction, even without regulation? Thank you. Kieran, <laughs> you'll probably be the person for this because this is this is a loaded topic. Because I mean, you, you are you are talking about um, an open banking architecture, and you're talking also talking about regulation um, regulation that I mentioned earlier. Let me just take a snap at it real quick. Uh, I, I have been following the Congressional Research um, Service. Uh, they released uh, an interesting document back in April. Uh, that talk about uh, deals with regulations that address the open banking uh, component. So it is it is a fascinating uh, fascinating read. So let me provide some quick background real quick, and then Kieran, I think you'll probably be best to talk about the API component. So we do have a trusted financial system, as I mentioned, because the federal government provided some guarantee on our deposits, right? So traditional banks are pretty much trusted in that aspect. The same regulations that protect financial banking institutions are the same regulations in some aspect that's holding them back when it comes into the other world. So in many of you, I don't need to remind anybody about the global financial crisis in 2007 and 2008. So some of those regulations do have a purpose. So fintech companies do not fall under the same regulations of traditional banks. So they have more latitude to innovate. They can improve the efficiency of the financial system and also help customers and make um, make banking you know, more fun, if I can use that word. So the question of the challenge is whether the existing legal and regulatory frameworks when taking into consideration new technologies, new capabilities, and new innovations from fintech companies can effectively protect consumers against harms without handicapping the benefits that they can get from technology. So some, some aspect that falls under regulations, we have proliferation of internet access and mobile technology, big data, alternative data, cloud computing, data security. Now you talk about open banking, talking about the API, just for the audience to, to, to have a good understanding of that, the technology that's often used to collect account data is what we call the web scraping. It is a technique that skins website and extract data from it. So pretty much when you go online, you enter your, your username and password, that software goes to your bank, to your connect with your bank and pretty much it scrapes the data because mostly all that information is available. Now, although it is advantageous because it gets all that information pretty much right away, uh, but it also offers some drawbacks in terms of data uh, websites of this. Most financial institutions provide access to customer uh, information through what we call the structured data feed or API or application programming interface, whatever that you can call it. It is an alternative to web scraping, which is which one is better, web scraping or API? Um, you know, it is for discussion. API API appears to be more secure in terms of cybersecurity and fraud risk. When we use API bank standards with customer approval to share um, information from the bank and from that third party software, we call that open banking. And many people use some tools to manage their personal, personal finance, such as Mint, that really much connect your account to, to track your spending and so on and so forth. So the benefits are there. The main issue remains privacy, security, and cybersecurity. I'm sorry, privacy issues and cybersecurity. Open banking initially, uh, open banking initiative, uh, rather, typically specify when and how financial institutions can share your data. For example, the UK regulators require customers to approve of information sharing with specific parties. US banks, from my understanding, I could be wrong, already have that control and limit how, in, how customer information is shared. And we input, of course, from the customers. And I'm not sure they are eager to give up that, that ability. So 
the regulators in the U.S. face three, I would say four major questions. Should data security be prescriptive and follow a normative standards? And if so, that will lead to inflexibility and may harm innovation. Question two, should data security be government defined and outcome based? An outcome based approach will also lead for banks to now comply with a wide range of data standards. Question three, should relevant data security now, uh, security laws continue to cover all sensitive individual financial information? And last, should the scope of these laws be expanded? The answers to those questions will most likely dictate the direction the US banking industry will go along with regulations. So this is a long answer, but the short question is, the short answer to this question is, it will have to depend on how US regulators uh, understand and what type of leeway or what type of restriction they want to establish on, on US banking. Thank you, Jimmy. And I know we are uh, out of time. We planned for 45 minutes, but I'll just uh, go over a couple of minutes more to quickly hear uh, from Kiran and then also from Raj on the topic. Uh, you know, even though not in banking, it affects uh, in a parallel organization uh, is looking at it very, very keenly. So would love to hear from Raj as well. But uh, over to you, Kiran. Yeah, I think there are uh, there there is activity happening uh, as far as open API architectures go in the U.S. Right, there is no question about it. There is NACHA that is uh, coming up with API standards for ACH, uh, the FNS uh, group, right? But in addition to that, if you've seen the recent news with what uh, the Financial Data Exchange has done, right? They've added 33 new members uh, at, in 2020, right? So we are seeing the activity not in a regulated way, not coming from as part of, you know, as uh, like the Europe has done with PSD2. But what we are seeing is that there is more uh, acceptance to aligning to certain standards in the US, right? So there, I would say there is uh, the, uh, this is like the beginning of something of an open API architecture, regulated or not. I think Jimmy covered those points in great detail so I'll not repeat that. I think the key here, the key point for me was the whole privacy discussion, right? Even if the all the banking entities in the US or financial institutions come together and adopt FDX, for example, there's still this case of how do we manage customer privacy and consent? Uh, where does uh, the, how do we uh, regulate that, right? That part is key here to make sure that the customers that are, uh, that are using these services are comfortable with their data being shared. Uh, the other point that uh, I would say is that as we think about uh, customers, I think it's important to think about the, the teams or the organizations that are leveraging these APIs, right? Without a consistent standard, I think there is a lot of effort and time that goes into building all of these applications. And there's a lot of screen scraping happening. So purely from a technology perspective, there is a lot of advantages to adopting a standard across financial institutions. So I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to uh, you know, what happens with NACHA and what happens with FDX, because there's a lot of promise with modern leveraging modern architectures and going away from file-based transactions to more real-time because the world has become real-time in a very short time. Uh, and the financial institutions at this point are catching up. We just need to accelerate that path. Thank you, Kiran. Yeah, well, there is a technology-centric answer that like Kiran and uh, Jimmy both covered very nicely. But let's take a step back and first of all, understand why was open banking even introduced, right, for a minute. So that the problem in UK is that four banks, four or five banks, whatever, they had like 80% of market share. And uh, what worried the, the congressman there is that there is no competition between the banks. And once, once a customer goes into a bank and they are there for life. So that was a, that, that was a problem they were trying to address. And uh, the hope is that once we, once we open up, like, you know, 
to figure out who is paying what for how much uh, what uh, who is paying for what service how much then hopefully people will foster competition like banks will foster competition and so on right and for i don't know if that problem exists in us to begin with right i, I seriously doubt that problem exists in in us right so we have our market like we have like much more fragmentation than like four 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 banks and uh, then we have a uh, lot more um then there are like many many channels of getting the same information the competitive information and things like that so i seriously doubt that problem actually exists and i i'm guessing everybody like including banks and i think us uh, we are carefully looking at it and uh, we are i think um, taking a wait and see approach but right? like everybody uh, like i think like all of us uh, are looking at it very very closely watching the developments and then sort of when things happen if and when things happen in us i think we are ready yeah i would uh, i would like to add to one point to that i think it's very fair what raj brought up uh, in terms of challenges but where i see the opportunity for all organizations in the financial space is the innovation that comes out of having open apis and standards right so that that is what we are starting to see a lot of in the uk i think the us will benefit a lot with the standardization yep and uh, you know close sister industry insurance is also seeing a big big benefit coming out of open api architecture so the next not only 2021 next few years uh, are really going to be very interesting both from a technology and business perspective for this industry and i know with that we'll wrap up today's session uh, thank you so much to all our panelists jimmy sudhakar raj and kiran it was a great discussion we can go on because these are such interesting topics for a long time uh, we'll wrap up for now thank you to the audience uh, great set of questions we went through some of them uh, hopefully you found that very interesting uh, you can always contact us at the contact information you see on your screen we'll continue to have future webinars so be on the lookout and join us again thank you have a great day everyone thank you rahul thanks okay. thank you bye